August 25th, 2020 Planning Commission meeting. We continue to operate in a virtual environment and will likely do so through the fall. I'd like to ask the patients as we use this platform for our public meeting. There may be slight delays as we transition between speakers, presenters, and participants. If any participants have issues with the technology, please send a message to the moderator. We have six items and one committee report on our agenda today. A majority of these items have been discussed previously. I would ask that the commission members to focus comments and questions on the identified outstanding issues for each request. We may hear an abbreviated staff presentation for items that have previously appeared before us. And I would ask that the commissioners, the commissioners to hold all questions until the conclusion of all presentations and any public comments. I would also ask that each commissioner, well, I would also ask that each commissioner be recognized by the chairperson before speaking. With seven discussion items on the agenda today, I would ask everyone to be efficient with our time so that we can discuss all items. I did receive an email from the applicant for case Z920, which is Page Road and World Trade Boulevard, item F1, and they wish to submit new conditions on this case. So without objection, I would like to defer this request and staff will calendar the item once uh, new zoning conditions have been received and reviewed. Okay, with that, uh, we will move on to the committee report. Um, the commission has engaged the subcommittees and we have one committee report this morning. Item C1, the text change committee met on August 18th to discuss the text change for TC620. I would like to ask the chairperson of the text change committee to give a brief overview of the conversation, and then I will entertain a motion and a vote. Commissioner Mann? Hey, thank you, Tika. Yes, um, we met on the 18th of August. We discussed two text change cases. Um, we'll be making a motion for one of those today, but in short, we talked about the first case was TC 1419, uh, dealing with site plans and plot plan revisions. Um, there were a couple of outstanding issues that we needed to massage out with that case. Uh, so we called for a special meeting on September the 10th to continue the discussion and to finalize and hear back from staff on some questions and comments that we made. So um, TC 1419, uh, we've called a special meeting uh, to further the discussion. And we've also got a lot more text changes coming down the pipeline. So we wanted to also call a special meeting to kind of get ahead of the, the curve on a lot of stuff that we're going to be seeing. So. Um, that's why we have that September 10th meeting. Um, the second text change that we talked about on the 18th was uh, TC6-20, dealing with neighborhood transition requirements uh, and senior housing. Um, in short, that text change amends the Part 10 Raleigh UDO to apply appropriate exemptions to the neighborhood transition requirements and simplify and align congregate care and continuing care retirement community requirements with state and federal regulations. Uh, basically, we, we made text changes or staff made text changes and we agreed on all of them to kind of align um, our requirements in the tech, in the UDO with federal and state regulations dealing with neighborhood, neighborhood transition requirements and senior housing. Um, so uh, with that, if there's any questions I can entertain and we're ready to make a motion, I, I believe, from our text change committee. Any questions for... Commissioner Mann? Uh, Commissioner Winters. Thank you. It's not necessarily a question about the text. My question is, was this um, available to citizens in real time to see or to review, to give feedback to us? Was, are you asking what was text change 6-20? Is that what you're no, asking? The video in and of itself, because I tried to find, I could not find it. And I, my question is, has this been open to all citizens to review or to be a part of? So this is Travis. Um, I heard from our communication staff that the session was recorded and it was going to be uploaded to the YouTube channel. Don't know if that's happened yet, but that was um, what they have said. 
Okay. So and because I was looking for it even after that conversation and it still had not, it had not been. And so I'm just kind of hesitant to um, move forward without having, without uh, following, without having it being visible to um, citizens, um, for, without having had that protocol followed, uh, just to give an opportunity for citizens to see and to hear uh, since we're in, we're in a virtual meeting and these are these are open meetings for citizens. So, Travis, am I correct that there was a live link on the website for people to click to join the web event? That's been our customary practice. I'm not sure if there was for this meeting, but that's been um, what we've attempted to do. Um, we, we had several members of the public participate, and I just didn't know how they got on if they if there wasn't a, a method like that. I know that I tried to get onto the meeting just to listen in, and I was not able to. Um, and I did not know I needed to sign up in advance to do that. I was not able to either. Yeah, we'll need to fix that. Right. And I think maybe a part of maybe the verbiage is sign up to participate or to have statements or to give a statement versus just to be an active listener. I think maybe that's the confusion in the wording and execution. So am sure. I hearing? Go ahead. I'm sorry, I was gonna say these are all great comments uh, and I appreciate the feedback. One thing that we've talked with staff about in communications is about making the information much clearer and more transparent on the Planning Commission website. Since you're going to be re-engaging all of your subcommittees, we've got some ideas about how we can place that information near the top of the website and allow people just to simply click on a link if they want to watch a meeting and not necessarily join it. Thank you. So um, what is the will of the commission? Do we want to entertain a motion or um, uh, uh, do we have enough concerns that we would want to do something else like hold it at the table till the next meeting? Uh, Commissioner O'Haver. I'm just curious, um, either David or Travis, procedurally what, what could occur? I mean, we, we I guess people could call in and say they weren't part of the meeting and they had comments during the meeting and aren't comfortable. I guess I'm just trying to understand procedurally what would happen. So what I would say about that is, um, you know, not everyone attends every one of our meetings and these meetings are linear in process. So the text change committee will review uh, verbiage in the text change and make a recommendation as will the planning commission. And ultimately, the public hearing will occur in front of the city council. So there will be ample opportunities for people to reach out and comment on a text change. I would also note that we have started um, placing all of our text changes on an online portal for commenting. And this text change was placed on the portal and allowed for public comment. So I, I feel like there was ample opportunity here for the public to engage. And if I could, sorry, Commissioner Winters. And Correct me if I'm wrong, Travis, I think, I think I remember from the from the text change committee meeting that this particular text change has been in committee for an extended period of time, or am I not accurate in saying that? I'm not certain that it's been in committee for an ex extended period of time. I'd have to check with staff on that. Okay, thank you. Okay, so... Um it sounds like we may be ready um, to receive a motion, but Commissioner Winters. But I have more of a comment than a than a um, motion to say that I do appreciate that the text change um, that they do have the portal and, and getting the feedback from citizens. That's great, and I think it's important. But I also think it's important for citizens to hear in real time the conversation that is being had, and that's the one thing that's being missed. So for that reason, I make a motion that we hold it. We hold this um, text change until the video can be uploaded to give people an opportunity to hear the discussion, uh, because that's only one part. Making a suggestion is one part. Hearing the discussion is the other part. And then the latter part is what we hear today. But how um, the final decision 
was arrived is the part that's missing. So I move that we hold the conversation, we hold this text change until um, the video can be uploaded, which hopefully this will help uh, get the video uploaded in, in a, uh, sooner than it has been. Thank you, Commissioner Winter. So we have a motion on the table to hold the uh, text change um, until our next meeting. Is there a second? Second. Commissioner McIntosh seconded. it. Any further discussion? Um, I do have one quick question on in section one, item C, uh, neighborhood transitions, et cetera. I think that's where it is. I, um, it looked like in the report, short-term rentals was listed as part of the building, okay. time, but in the text change, it's not. So I just wanted to confirm that short-term rentals is not included in uh, the language for this text change. And that's, I guess, a question for staff. That's correct. The committee requested that that be removed. And so the draft that was included in the agenda packet for this morning's meeting reflects the edit of removing short-term rental from that section. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so we have a motion and a second. Um, I would ask Shanitha for a roll call of members to record individual votes. And at the end of the roll call, I'll announce the outcome of the vote. Janitha? Yes, ma'am. Thank um, you. Thank you. Commissioner Bennett, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Fox? Aye. Commissioner Hicks? Aye. Commissioner Lampman? Aye. Commissioner Mann? Aye. Commissioner McIntosh? Aye. Commissioner O'Haver? Aye. And Commissioner Winters? Aye. Okay, uh, that's a unanimous vote to hold text change um, PC620 um, until our next Planning Commission meeting. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the first order of business, the consent agenda. This is a list of requests that can be acted upon in motion. Instead of acting on each request individually, the commission can approve the items with one motion and vote. There are two items on the consent agenda. Both items appear to satisfy timing requirements for delivery of the request to the planning commission. To clarify, the commission is not voting on the final disposition of the application and is simply deferring discussion to a future agenda. With that, I would ask for a motion to approve the items on the con consent agenda. Commissioner Fox. Uh, motion to approve items on the consent agenda. Okay, and do we have a second? Commissioner second. Lampman. Second. Commissioner, thank you. Commissioner Fox has offered a motion to approve and Commissioner Lampman has um, seconded the motion. I will ask Shanitha for a roll call of members to record their in, the individual vote. And at the end of the roll call, I will announce the outcome of the vote. Commissioner Bennett, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Fox? Aye. Commissioner Hicks? Aye. Commissioner Lampman? Aye. Commissioner Mann? Aye. Commissioner McIntosh? Aye. Commissioner O'Haver? Aye. And Commissioner Winters? Aye. Thank you. The vote is unanimous. And um, so we uh, have approved the consent agenda. Um, we will now begin old business portion of the agenda. These are requests that have appeared on previous Planning Commission agenda. The first item is item E1, uh, number Z720, Millbrook Road. This is a request to rezone approximately three acres of land from residential R4 to commercial mixed use, three stories, parking limited, conditional use, that's CX3 PLCU. 
This request was discussed at the August 11th meeting where the item was deferred to allow the applicant to amend zoning conditions. Staff will provide a very brief overview of the case, focusing on the new conditions that have been offered. I would ask that our discussion today be focused on the revised zoning conditions. If a re recommendation is not made on this case today, a time extension will be required. Hannah Reckow will present on behalf of city staff. Hannah? We, if you, I uh, think you might be muted. We can't hear you. Good morning. Um, so this is, as uh, the chair person said, this is Z720. Uh, it was discussed at your last meeting and deferred to this meeting to allow the um, applicant to amend the conditions, which they have. Um, if we go to the next slide, just as a quick reminder of the location, this is north of downtown near the intersection of East Millbrook Road and Falls of Moose Road, um, adjacent on one side to a shopping center and on the other two sides to a low density residential neighborhood. Go forward um, to the, the next slide after that, we can um, look at the conditions. So the first 10 conditions um, remain unchanged. So this and the next this slide um, represent those conditions. Uh, condition 11, and was amended uh, to add hours of operation for retail sales, personal service, and restaurant bars, um, no earlier than 6 a.m. and no later than 11 p.m. Uh, condition 12 was added um, to add a, a principal building setback of 40 feet in Millbrook Road right away. And then the uh, final condition that was added pertains to the location of any drive through windows that are located on the site. It would be limited to an area that's 200 feet from the Millbrook Road right of way and 200 feet from the adjacent um, shopping center, the property boundary, Eastern property boundary. Good. Um, and this exhibit remains a part of the conditions that shows the buffer area described in two of the conditions. Let's go to the next slide. Um, the um, entitlement. Uh, total uh, square footage remains the same in the amended conditions. So um, office or total, I should say totals, um, square footage remains 40,000 square feet and uh, retail is limited to 20,000 square feet. Uh, the following slide, as a reminder that a request is inconsistent with the future land use map, and approval of this request would uh, amend the map to neighborhood mixed use. The next slide. Uh, there's no urban form guidance. Um, the request uh, is uh, still inconsistent overall with the company's plan, it includes the future land use map designation. Um, the amended conditions did improve uh, consistency with the policy regarding uh, the impact of commercial uses on the surrounding area. Um, the following slide shows the policies that are remaining in, inconsistent. Um, those are regarding uh, scale of design, transitions between higher and lower intensity uses, and concentrating retail and nodes rather than along a road corner, as well as the future land use map. And with that, uh, I can take any questions. Okay, thank you. Um, and I would ask that we hold our questions until um, we've, um, if we have, if we will be hearing from Michael Birch. Michael Birch is here representing the applicant. He's previously presented to the Planning Commission and he's here to answer any additional questions that we may have. And I'll remind you if we can try to focus our um, discussion on the new conditions that were offered. Um, are there any questions for Mr. Birch? Okay. Um, there's no one here from the, uh, no one signed up from the public to speak today. So um, seeing no questions or comments, I would entertain a motion. Please um, remember to be recognized before you make a motion and the motion should cite comprehensive plan consistency and include a statement why the request is reasonable and in the public interest. 
A commissioner who wishes to second the motion should raise their hand and be recognized. Okay, <laughs> no one's up for a motion. Commissioner Haver. I'll try to go for it. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I move to recommend approval of rezoning case Z720. The rezoning request is reasonable in the public interest supported by specific <laughs> policies and the comprehensive plan. Okay, do I have a second? Commissioner Fox. If I can have a second. Mr. York? Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, Commissioner O'Haver, if you could indicate whether or not the zoning request is consistent with the future land use map and the comprehensive plan overall. You said it was in the public interest because it promoted certain policies in the comprehensive plan, but you didn't give the consistency statement. I think you're, you need to unmute. I'm normally so much better at that. Sorry, y'all. Um, I thank you, Mr. York. Um, I believe it's compatible with the surrounding area. I believe it includes conditions that will mitigate the impact on adjacent properties. All right. Is that adequate? We just need you to say whether you think it's consistent or inconsistent with the comprehensive plan and feature land use map. That's all we're looking for there. I, I believe it is consistent, supported by specific policies in the comprehensive plan that I listed. Okay. Um, do I have a second? Commissioner Fox. Thank you. All right, we have a motion on the table to um, approve um, this case and a second. Um, is there any further discussion? Okay, if seeing no other further discussion, I would ask Janitha for a roll call of members to record their individual votes. And at the end of the roll call, I will announce the outcome. Commissioner Bennett, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Fox? Aye. Commissioner Hicks? Aye. Commissioner Lampman? Aye. Commissioner Mann? Aye. Commissioner McIntosh? Aye. Commissioner O'Haver? Aye. Commissioner Winters. Aye. Thank you. The vote is unanimous. Um, case Z720 um, passes. The next item is um, item E2, case number Z1120, Chapel Hill Road. Um, this is a request to rezone less than one acre of land from R10 to neighborhood mixed use. Three stories parking limited. This is a general use case without zoning conditions. This request appeared on the 20, June 23rd agenda, but was not discussed. Uh, JP Mansolf will present on behalf of the city. JP. Good morning, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you, thank you. Great. Uh, so this is rezoning case Z1120, which is uh, a request to rezone just under an acre of property from residential 10 to neighborhood mixed use, three stories with a parking limited frontage. Uh, the planning commission deadline for action is September 21st, 2020, uh, which means the last meeting uh, before that would be the September 8th meeting. Uh, so here is a aerial of the surrounding area. So the site is just west of where Hillsborough Street splits into Chapel Hill Road going east and Hillsborough going south. Uh, it's in the Westover retail area, which includes several other local businesses. Uh, and to the north of the site is the Westover residential neighborhood. Um, 
Further east is the state fairgrounds, uh, and the broader area includes uh, a significant amount of industrial uses. Slide, please. Uh, zooming in a bit, you can see uh, Mount Vernon in Middle School is just to the west. Uh, Blaylock Paving is on the site's east side, and the again, the west Westover residential neighborhood is, is just to the north. Here's a few street views of the site. Um, as you can see, it's currently a single family home on the site. Uh, and in uh, image number two, you can see Gary Street dead ends uh, into the site. Uh, so here's a summary of existing versus proposed entitlement. Uh, the proposed district would allow an increase uh, in residential entitlement and would also allow uh, office and retail uses that would be allowed uh, under the current R10 zoning. Next. So the requested uh, NX district is consistent with the neighborhood mixed use designation on the future land use map. Uh, it's also the uh, the parking limited frontage uh, included in the request is, is consistent with the transit oriented district and urban thoroughfare designations on the urban form map and that frontage would limit parking between the building and the street to a maximum of two bays of parking with a drive aisle in between. Uh, so overall, the request is consistent with the comprehensive plan in addition to being consistent with the future land use map and urban format. Uh, here's a list of consistent policies. Uh, the request would allow a greater mix of uses in close proximity to uh, existing 30 minute transit service that is planned to increase uh, in the future to 15 minutes as a part of the uh, Wake Transit Plan. And that stop is about 500 feet away at Hillsborough and Marsh. Uh, it would also provide appropriate transition from the more intense uh, industrial uses to the south and uh, or to the residential neighborhood to the north. Uh, and that last policy refers to the arena specific area guidance, which calls for minimizing parking along Hillsborough and Chapel Hill road uh, and parking limited would be consistent with reducing that parking between the building and the street. Uh, here's some inconsistent policies. Um, so conditions requiring a high, higher levels of buffering between the development on site and the residential uh, area would make the request more consistent with uh, LU 5.6 uh, and 7. LU 7.5 uh, and UD 6.1 speak to some of the auto-oriented and high impact uses allowed in NX like vehicle repair or vehicle fuel cells that aren't necessarily desirable close to your residential neighborhood. Um, lim limiting these uses would improve consistency with those policies uh, and the arena specific area guidance recommends conditions to ensure that the ground floor retail is included in developments and since there are no conditions in the request uh, it's inconsistent with that last policy. Uh, there are no outstanding issues, uh, and the deadline for action is September 21st, 2020. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and I would um, ask that we hold our questions until all persons have spoken on this matter. Um, now we will hear from the applicant, Evan Lohr. Um, the applicant has 10 minutes to provide a presentation. Mr. Lohr? Hello, Ms. Hicks. Um, nice to see you today. Um, I just want to briefly introduce myself and my, my client. Um, I'm a, a, an attorney here in Raleigh um, and represent Frida Paneros, who owns this property. Um, we, we don't have too much in the way of a presentation this morning, um, but I want to be available to answer questions from the Planning Commission members and anybody um, from the neighborhood who might be on the call. Um, it's our view that it's a pretty straightforward request. Um, the, um, all of the, well, I should say most of the um, comparable properties on this side of the road, with the exception of the one immediately adjacent to the property, were rezoned to this same designation um, in X3PL um, in 2014 with the, the um the big UDO rezoning um and, and we just want to to rezone it to that designation um 
So with that, I'm free to, to answer any questions about the property. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, there are a uh, few members from the public signed up to speak today. As a reminder, each speaker has two minutes to provide comment on this matter. Um, the first one up, I believe, is Lisa Thrower. Lisa, are you on? Yes, yes, I am. Thank you. Um, Welcome. I, would, I was hoping to be able to defer my two minutes to Maggie. Um, if that's possible, okay. we, we have kind of voted her <laughs> the unofficial uh, spokesperson for the neighborhood. Many of us have the same concerns. Okay, I, I think, um, Travis, that's fine, isn't it? Yes, that sounds great. Thank you. Thank All you right. so much. Um, thank you. Um, the next speaker that I have is Will Hayes. Mr. Hayes, are you on? Can you hear us? Do we have uh, Will Hayes on the line? He's connected and unmuted, but I'm not hearing anything. Okay, thank you. Um, should we move on to uh, Margaret Lawrence and see if he can get connected uh, in the interim? Um, Margaret Lawrence, are you available to speak? Hi, yes, I am. Thank you. And you've been given, I think, a minute and 40 seconds plus the two minutes that you're allotted. So that's three minutes and 40 seconds. Great. Um, I have two questions. One of our questions came up when the landowners were getting the property resurveyed and the city said that they wanted to reserve the right of way, a right of way from Gary Street to Hillsboro or to Chapel Hill Road. And we, our neighborhood, we just, we'd like to uh, get assurance that that right of way has been, um, has been passed. And so that if the property is gonna be rezoned, the city, um, takes away the right to uh, have a right of way to make a connecting road to our neighborhood. And that's one of our questions. Um, if you want to answer that first, or should I ask my second question? Um, I'll go ahead and ask your second question. Okay. And then, you know, our second concern is that we understand um, that it, it is comparable with the future plan for Westover, Hillsboro, um, connecting, but it currently does not um, support the current conditions of Westover and the area, um, Mount Vernon. There's no sidewalks there. There are no um, bike lanes, and it's heavily used by pedestrians already. I often see moms with strollers and pedestrians walking to stores or grocery stores or the hardware store or the, the adjacent school um, and then bike lane there's it's heavily it's a, a strong corridor that connects kind of downtown Raleigh to the open space near um, the art museum and uh, the Umstead and Shank and all and just the open space out there but there's just no connection so we I see a lot of bikers trying to maneuver from Barrel Road you know, over to Ebers Mill where there are bike lanes and sidewalks and it's just not doable. So it currently does not support the um, infrastructure and transportation models there. So adding, um, adding more density to this area would make things more complicated and not safe. Okay, thank you. Do you have any other questions or um, so yeah, so I was just going to put my opposition uh, for concern. Um, and then the question that our neighborhood is um, interested in is the making understanding if the city is um, not interested, wonder wondering if the city is still interested in a right of way that connects Gary Street to Chapel Hill Road. And if so, we have we would have um, many more questions to follow up. Okay, thank you. So um, 
Travis, uh, let me know if this isn't the best way to go, but I, I think it might be um, helpful to allow um, Mr. Birch to respond to that and city staff if, if for the questions that are relevant to staff. I think it's Mr. Mr. Lohr. I'm oh, I'm so right. sorry, Mr. Lohr. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Trying to keep up. My and apologies. That would be appropriate. We have Jason Myers on the line to answer questions about transportation as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is Jason Myers in the Department of Transportation for the city. Um, what the, the citizen reference was that when the applicant first came to the city, or maybe not first, but at some point during the pre-application process, there was a discussion about the extension of the street um, to Chapel Hill Road, which at that time may have been required by, uh, by the development code. Um, that's Gary Street I'm, I'm referencing. And that was communicated to the applicant at that time. Since that time, Planning Commission and City Council have amended the UDO to remove that requirement from this property. There is at least two, I think, different exemptions from block perimeter standards that were, we have told the applicant about. Uh, the main one is minimum site area. This, this site is much below the minimum site area to have the block perimeter standards apply. Therefore, there's no requirement for them to, to extend that street as a part of the development plan like there may have been in the past before that extra. It was TC6 2019. Is that clear? Does that answer that question? Um, um, Ms. Lawrence, does that answer your question? Uh, that does answer the question. So it sounds like it just the area is just not large enough to be able to put a road through. The, the way that our, our code was constructed previously was that we have standards for block perimeter that um, when subdivision of land happens or when administrative site plans are reviewed, if there isn't sufficient street network to meet those standards, there's a requirement to, to extend and, and dedicate new streets. And past, the requirement to get an exemption from that was a little bit vague. It was... Through, through staff and it was determined that it would be a better process to um, provide some very specific exemptions. And one of those specific exemptions is the minimum site area. And the idea is that if a development site is very small, it's a disproportionate um, impact on that development to extend public infrastructure um, that takes up a high percentage of that site. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, does that, uh, I guess that also addresses your questions about sidewalks and bike lanes. Has that been addressed? I, I didn't answer those questions and I don't know that, that that's a, you know, the, a perfectly clear uh, answer to that question. Inside the residential neighborhood, it's really up to the property owners there to decide if they want to do street improvement petitions and pay the assessments to put in curb and gutter and sidewalks. And there's a petition process um, through which they can request that. Along Hillsborough Street, it is a capital project to, to build those sidewalks. And we have a lot of needs for, for that sort of infrastructure. And it's hard to be able to build them everywhere if you want. But I also want to make it clear and remind council, or I'm sorry, planning commission that any administrative site plan or subdivision of land abutting Hillsborough be required to build it segment of sidewalk. While that's not necessarily a network, it does get us incrementally closer to having a complete sidewalk. Okay, so are you saying um, if this piece of property goes to site plan at that time, they would be required to at least provide um, those, some of those amenities, the sidewalks, bike lane, what it, not the bike lane, but the sidewalk on their property. Well, they have time. to meet the standards of the uh, UDO section 8.5, article 8.5 um, for improvements to existing streets, which those footage improvements almost always include sidewalks and they usually include some sort of bike facility as well. When there's a very short segment, bike facilities are much more difficult to tie in appropriately. Um, but yes, and, and there are cases in which um, the administrative review process allows for a uh, developer to build more sidewalk than required and then ask the city for reimbursement of that. So there could be some additional sidewalk that could be done, um, but that's it's really at the applicant's discretion and if they want to participate in that reimbursement program. 
Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Lawrence, does that answer the questions, the two questions that you had? Um, yes, well, my sidewalk question and, and, and corridor question was more of a concern, not a question. Um, and I recognize that they would need to build a sidewalk. Um, it was just more that if we increase density to the area, um, this area is not set up to, um, ha to have higher density at the moment. So just wanted to put that concern out there. Thank you very much for, for that. Um, you still have 41 seconds left um, if, if you need it um, at the end. I think we're ready to move on to Will Hayes. Will Hayes, are you available? Mr. Hayes? He, he said his mic is still not working. Um, he did pass on comments to me. Okay. His concern is the intersection at Chapel Hill Road and Hillsborough Street, and that it's very difficult to get into and out of the businesses on the southern side of Hillsborough Street. Okay. Um, does anybody, does Steph want to address that or uh, the applicant? It's from Myers, it's not. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? All right, double click the mute button. This is Jason Myers. And, and Ray, I'm sorry, I couldn't clearly hear what you said, though I understood it to be about access on Chapel Hill Road. On the, on the south side. The, um, uh, yeah, just the, just the difficulty of getting into and out of the businesses on the southern side of Hillsborough Street, particularly near the intersection of Chapel Hill Road. Okay. Um, at this site, and I think my, your uh, your mic kind of faded on me there a little bit, Ray. But are you talking about access along this corridor in general, or on this site? Uh, William says corridor. Okay. Um, yeah, that's it, it, that's really a function of it not being a complete street and having a median that we would want to see in the future there and having a lot of driveway and driveway cuts, I think, in that um, our our standard support site plans and, and cross access and minimizing driveways will over time help that if there's redevelopment. And if there's a cap, if we're able to budget a capital project to, to make some improvements, there can be a, a change as well, but that, that would rely on the Okay, thank you very much. Um, so those are the speakers that we have uh, from signed up from the public. Um, I would now like to allow for questions and comments from commissioners. Does anyone have questions? If so, please be recognized to speak. Um, Commissioner Lantman. Um, forgive me if I just didn't understand um, properly. I just wanted to summarize. So. Gary Street will not be extended through this site because of the current setback requirements. Is that right? Just to confirm confirmation. That is true. This case to yeah. And then regarding the sidewalk, does the applicant have to require or have to put a condition in the request? A condition to do what? Put in the sidewalk. No, that is a requirement of the UDO for administrative site reviews and subdivisions. Okay. So something here that would be reviewed under a plot plan, then there would be no requirements for public improvements. Um, but that would basically kind of lock in the current amount of development on the site. Okay. All right. Any other questions for the applicant or staff? Uh, Commissioner Bennett. Sorry, my space bar isn't working this morning to unmute me. Um, regarding the school that's um, so close to the site, has there been any coordination with the school? I, mean, I note um, the resident was talking about the absence of sidewalks. I would think if 
more high density development is going in there, there might be some travel between the school and any residences that might be put in there. I mean, is there some opportunity to get you know, sidewalks, bike lanes, better connectivity, I guess, between that area and the school for safer travel? So this is Casey Myers. Um, I think I'll, I'll leave some of this to the, the case planner. My understanding is that school is not a neighborhood school, but it is kind of a, a regional magnet middle school um, for a special population of students. Um, but I'm not very certain of that. It is possible that the, the applicant could do work within the existing right of way between their site and the school. And there is sufficient, there's a fair amount of right of way there. Um, there are also some large trees and the lack of curb and gutter. So doing anything in that right of way is likely to be pretty expensive and, and relatively disruptive to the, to the existing character um, along Chapel Hill through that track. Hi, this is JP. Uh, I also just wanted to add, uh, in terms of communication, um, Wake County was sent uh, notification of the rezoning. Um, I haven't heard any communication. I don't know if the applicant has had any communication, but um, they were notified uh, of the reason. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, I've gotten a request that uh, Mr. Lohr would like a chance to respond, and since he did not use his uh, time for a presentation, um, we will do that. It, before I move to Mr. Lohr, are there any other additional questions from commissioners? Okay, seeing none, uh, Mr. Lohr, would you like uh, like to respond? If you're speaking, oh, there you go. Sure, th thank you, uh, Ms. Hicks. Um, yeah, I'll just try to address those concerns in turn. Um, to, to Ms. Lawrence's concern regarding the right of way from, from Gary Street to Chapel Hill Road, uh, when we initially filed the case, we had a condition in it to prevent the, that connection from being made. And of course, as the, the staff members have said, the policy changed. And so we removed the condition in response. Um, and so now it's for me, it's not really a, you know, whether that's connected doesn't have anything to do with our zoning case. Of course, if the city wants to do it, they can. They can use eminent domain, but that would be independent of our zoning case entirely. Um, as to the bike lanes and sidewalks, I think that's mostly just a city issue, right? I mean, I, I, I don't think it has, you know, it's, there's really anything to do with our zoning case that's sort of a larger issue um, with the city and how the, you know, the roads are set up over there. Um, as far as the density issue, when, when the council approved the UDO, um, they decided and the future land use map, they decided that the the designation that they wanted for these properties was neighborhood mixed use, which is necessarily more dense than what is there now. Um, as Mr. Mansoff showed in his, um, in his presentation, in, in terms of residential units for this property, the change would be from, from nine that are presently allowed to, I think it was 29. Um, and, and that's sort of the city's policy is, is that's the, the type of development that they want on Hillsborough Street and Chapel Hill Road uh, in this area uh, as it changes from sort of an industrial area to more of, a, I think, more of a just a general commercial um, type area. Um, the intersection issue, I think that's also... Um, if the city wants this area to be neighborhood mixed use, that's, that's more of a city issue also. Um, but the, the area is already pretty heavily trafficked and, um, and generally handles it pretty well. Um, and, and, you know, we're not trying to build a 10 story office tower. That's going to, going to add a, a huge number of trips every day. And, and the city staff has already done a, um, a study showing the, the added trips and it wasn't 
I don't have it right in front of me at the moment, um, but it's uh, it, it wasn't an enormous amount of of trips added to that area and that intersection. Um, and so we, and I think that's all of the concerns that were raised. Um, and, and if there's anything else, I'd certainly like to reserve my time. But we would just ask that because this this um, request is consistent with the comprehensive plan, consistent with the future land use map. Um, that the commission approve it. Thank you, Mr. Lohr. Um, so um, if we don't have any more ad additional comments, I think I, uh, we could entertain a motion. Um, I do want to point out that this is a general use case. Um, please remember to be recognized before you make a motion. The motion should cite comprehensive plan consistency and include a statement why the request is reasonable and in the public interest. A commissioner who wishes to second the motion should raise their hand and be recognized. Um, would anybody like to entertain a motion? Oh, uh, Commissioner Haver. I move to recommend approval of rezoning case Z1120. Um, it is consistent with the, it's found to be consistent with the future land use map and the comprehensive plan. I believe the rezoning request is reasonable and in the public interest because it is compatible with the surrounding areas and enables development of a constrained or underutilized site. Thank you, Commissioner Haver. Uh, do we have a second? Commissioner Fox. Thank you, we have a second. Second. Um, so we have a motion and a second um, to approve um, zoning case Z1120. I uh, will ask Shanita for a roll call of members to record the, the individual vote. And at the end of the roll call, I will announce the outcome of the vote. Um, Commissioner Bennett, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Fox? Aye. Commissioner Hicks? Aye. Commissioner Lampman? Aye. Commissioner Mann? Aye. Commissioner McIntosh? Aye. Commissioner O'Haver? Aye. And Commissioner Winters. Aye. Thank you. The vote is unanimous and, um, sorry, <laughs> case Z1120 uh, passes. We move on to the next. Uh, thank you very much um, to the applicant and presenters for your time today. The next case is uh, item E3, case number Z1220, Prince Drive. This is a request to rezone approximately 1.8 acres of land from residential one with the Swift Creek over a watershed protection overlay district to residential six conditional use with the watershed overlay district retained. This request was discussed on May 12th on the May 12th meeting as a general use case. The case was deferred to allow the applicant to convert to a conditional use request. I would like to ask for a brief update from staff, focusing on the conditions that have been offered. We have already had an applicant presentation and have, have already heard from the public on this request. Ira Mabel will now provide an overview from staff. Hello, good morning. This is Ira. Um, good morning. Good morning. Yeah, so the last you heard this case in May was a general use. Um, there were two members of the public who spoke with some concerns. And so the applicant has, has added it to zoning conditions. That will be most of what I talk about today. Um, and there was that the August meeting, you requested an extension from council or the, the June meeting, excuse me, June 30. <clears throat> um, so the new deadline for this case is September 9th. Uh, just a reminder, so this case is um, in the Swift Creek watershed that all that green area is, um, town of Cary jurisdiction. 
Um, so the the nearest major intersection you might know um, can think of is Tryon Road and Jones Franklin Road there. Um, and this is about about the center of Prince Drive, about a quarter mile street um, between Tryon and Jones Franklin. Um, so the site is currently undeveloped and forested. Um, so the two conditions have been added. One um, adds a, a maximum number of units at four. Um, and the other one is increases the front setback to 15 feet. So the next slide I think is um, more helpful to show the difference. So the change here, um, under the current zoning, R1 could be three units because there are three ex existing lots that have access to a public street. Um, and so previously under a general use case, we were estimating 10, although I think there are some um, environmental features that would not allow that to actually be constructed in real life. Um, but now that cap is, is four. Um, so one more unit than can be built today. And the, the setback under the current zoning at 20 feet in R1 um, would have been 10 feet in R6 general use and is now 15, so halfway in between. Um, this uh, case has been consistent with the future land use map and remains so um, at low density residential, which recommends six units per acre. Um, and again, has, uh, has been consistent with the with the comprehensive plan overall and is still so. Um, there's there's one more meeting now under your new extended deadline. Uh, no other outstanding issues. I'd be happy to answer any other questions. Thank you. Um, Mr. Muhammad is here also to answer questions on behalf of the applicant. Um, we have already received uh, an applicant presentation, which was on May 12th. Um, we may wish to ask the applicant questions about the zoning conditions that have been offered, these two new ones. Um, does anyone have questions or comments? If so, uh, please be recognized to speak. Seeing some, no, shaking head no's. <laughs> okay. Um, there is no one signed up from the public to speak on this matter. So seeing no further comment, I would like to entertain a motion. Please remember to be recognized before you make a motion. The motion should cite comprehensive plan consistency and include a statement of why the request is reasonable and in the public interest. A commissioner who wishes to second the motion should raise their hand and be recognized. Uh, commissioner McIntosh. I move to recommend approval of rezoning case Z1220 Prince Drive. It is consistent with the future land use map and the comprehensive plan. And the rezoning it request is reasonable and in the public interest because it increases the housing supply in the area and is compatible with the surrounding area. And do we have a second? Commissioner Lampman. All right, we have a motion to approve and a second NISA for a roll call of members to record individual votes. And at the end of the roll call, I will announce the outcome of the vote. Commissioner Bennett, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Fox? Aye. Commissioner Hicks? Aye. Commissioner Lampman? Aye. Commissioner Mann? Aye. Commissioner McIntosh? Aye. Commissioner O'Haver? Aye. Commissioner Winters? Aye. Thank you. Uh, the vote is unanimous. Um, Z1220 Prince Drive uh, is uh, approved. Okay. Uh, moving on to the next case is item E4. Um, case number Z1520, Carolina Ave and Grove Ave. This is a request to rezone approximately 2.4 acres of land from residential six with the special with special residential parking overlay district to residential 10 conditional use. The parking overlay district would be retained. 
The request was listed on the June 30th meeting, but was not discussed. Uh, John Anagnost will present on behalf of city staff. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. As uh, Chair Hicks mentioned, this is Z-15-20 uh, in between Carolina Avenue and Grove Avenue. Uh, and it is a little over two acres proposed to be rezoned from residential six with a special residential parking overlay district to residential 10 with uh, conditions and the special residential parking overlay district. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this neighborhood you might be familiar with. There's been a couple of cases in this area the last six months or so. Uh, so just south of Western Boulevard and the zoning in the neighborhood is at this point uh, pretty much all residential six. Next slide, please. And here's the larger area. Uh, so you can see Western Boulevard to the north. And that is the location of a proposed bus rapid transit route, which will have at least one station within walking distance of this site. Uh, and then to the left, you can see the Harris Teeter Shopping Center at the corner of Jones Franklin Road and Western Boulevard. Uh, the other thing to note is that there is an undeveloped city park property uh, directly to the east of this site. Next slide, please. So the site itself has a couple of buildings on it right now. There's a, a technically apartment building uh, on the northwest corner. Uh, it, does a, it has the appearance of a townhouse building uh, in terms of horizontally integrated units, but it is an apartment building. Uh, and then on this slide, you can see that building in the, the top left, uh, that apartment building. And then on the northeast corner, there is a single family house, uh, which you can see in the bottom right image here. And then the other thing to note from these images is the image uh, at the top right and the lower left are looking towards the site from the south. And you can see the drop off in the elevation from the site towards the properties to the south. Uh, and you can see in particular in the top right image, there is the stream channel that comes to the edge of Carolina Avenue where it meets a storm drain. Next slide, please. And so this has a little bit more information about the, the drainage pattern in this area. So you can see the topography in the brown lines there. Uh, so generally the site is draining to the Southwest towards Carolina Avenue. And you can see the blue lines on this image are the stormwater network. And so blue represents open streams, open to the air. And then the red lines are storm drains. And so you can see uh, just south of this property, there is an open stream that comes to a storm drain. And you have re received some correspondence uh, from one of the property owners of that townhouse development there, uh, noting that there is localized flooding uh, around that storm drain. Next slide, please. There are three conditions offered with this case. Uh, one prohibits the apartment building type. Another requires a 30 foot setback with the two properties to the south for principal structures. And then the last one requires uh, roofs with a pitch of at least a four to 12 ratio. Next slide, please. So here's the entitlement difference between the existing zoning and the proposed zoning. I do wanna make a note here that the number of units and the density shown here is reflecting a cottage court style of development, which is possible on this site. Uh, if that was not selected, the cottage court has a density bonus that can be applied. If it was a, a conventional residential development, those numbers would be uh, 14 units for the existing zoning and 24 units for the proposed zoning. And you can see the setbacks there are pretty similar. Next slide, please. The future land use map in this area is split. So closer to Western Boulevard and towards the west, um, there is a moderate density residential designation and then farther to the south and east, it transitions to a low density residential designation. So this is kind of the transition point for the future land use map in this area. And so the proposed zoning would be consistent on the west side of the site where the designation is moderate density residential. It is inconsistent on the east side of the site where the low density residential is. Uh, and so overall that does tip the consistency for the future land use map towards inconsistent. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned earlier, there is a proposed uh, bus rapid transit route for Western Boulevard that would pass by this neighborhood. And so that does uh, include on the urban form map, a core transit area representing 
places where um, walkable areas would be appropriate to serve transit ridership. This neighborhood and, and the policy recommendation there with the, is that there should be a frontage applied uh, in many contexts. In this particular context, because of the, the somewhat detached character of the existing development in this neighborhood, uh, a frontage is not uh, really appropriate. Also, the requested zoning district is residential 10, which is a residential district, uh, which does not allow a frontage. So those two factors combined, um, the, the determination was that the urban form map was not very relevant for this case. And so overall, the request is consistent with the comprehensive plan. Uh, it's inconsistent with the future land use map, but it's consistent with policies having to do with increasing uh, the, the amount and types of housing in proximity to high quality transit service, so that bus rapid transit service. Uh, next slide, please. And also having to do um, with, with matching character. So the requirement for pitched roof and a setback and the prohibition of the apartment building type does bring the request more into conformity with the existing character of the neighborhood, which does uh, display a detached and townhouse type character currently. Next slide, please. There are a couple of policies that are inconsistent. Uh, first, the future land use map, and then a couple of policies relating to uh, um, you know, more strongly matching the character of new development architecturally with existing development. Uh, and so there could be some additional conditions um, to limit the mass of buildings, but generally um, the character of new development under the proposed zoning would be pretty similar to existing character. Next slide, please. All right, and near deadline is about a month from today. I can take any questions. Thank you very much. Um, we will uh, wait until all persons have spoken um, before uh, taking any questions? I will note that there is a staff on hand from Stormwater uh, in case uh, we have questions in that area. Worth Mills will now present on behalf of the applicant. The applicant has a total of 10 minutes to provide a presentation. Uh, there are also some members of the public signed up to speak today and we will get to those after the applicant. Mr. Mills? Yes, good morning, can you hear me? Good morning. Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. Uh, I have a presentation uh, that goes along, uh, a slide deck, I should say, that goes along with our presentation. If we could uh, pull that up on the screen, that would be great. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, so again, good morning, members of the Planning Commission. My name is Worth Mills. Uh, here on behalf of Grove Developers uh, for the rezoning at 601, 605 Carolina Avenue and 600 Grove Avenue. Uh, as John uh, mentioned, this is a rezoning from R6 to R10 uh, and retaining the uh, special parking overlay district. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here we have um, the existing conditions of the site today, uh, as John noted. Uh, the three parcels are just south of Western Boulevard on either side of, excuse me, uh, kind of bounded by Carolina Avenue uh, and Grove Avenue. Uh, you'll notice to your west the Harris Teeter uh, Shopping Center, as well as uh, the uh, two apartment complexes there, Madison Hunters Glen and, and Dutch Village. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a current zoning map of the area. As John mentioned, um, most of the properties um, in this area are zoned R6. Uh, we do have some mixed use zoning um, a little farther to our Northwest, which is where the uh, Harris Teeter Shopping Center is. Uh, there's some neighborhood mixed use uh, just Southwest of that. Uh, and then RX3 zoning for the uh, two uh, apartment complexes uh, that I previously mentioned. Uh, next slide, please. Here is the future land use map. Uh, as John mentioned, the um, parcels are, uh, two of the parcels are zoned moderate density residential, um, which recommends between six and 14 units per acre um, and recommends uh, a mix of housing types that includes um, detached, attached homes, townhomes, and apartments. Um, and then 
uh, the Grove Avenue, or excuse me, yeah, the Grove Avenue parcel is designated as low density residential, um, which uh, recommends a maximum density of six units per acre. And, you know, between the competing densities, you have a maximum of 14 on the moderate and a maximum of six on the low density. And we believe that uh, the R10 zoning district provides that middle ground, so to speak, between the uh, competing future land use map designations, um, and in our opinion, uh, would be consistent uh, with the future land use map. Next slide, please. Here we have the urban form map. As John mentioned, uh, these three parcels are located uh, within uh, a core transit area, uh, and Western Boulevard um, is designated uh, as part of the bus rapid transit route, and there would be a stop within walking distance um, of these uh, properties. Um, the urban form map and the, the BRT specifically um, note that it is important to locate residential density near those BRT stops and stations so that, um, you know, not only do they get used, you know, generally, and, and you know, we are, the city is, you know, making the most of its investment uh, in bus rapid transit, but also so that the individual residents themselves have multiple means of access um, throughout the city. And so, you know, while it may not be as important from, you know, a specific policy perspective, we do feel that it's important generally to further the goals of the BRT to create that sort of missing middle housing within these core transit areas and to really capitalize on the plans that the city has put forward. Next slide, please. This slide here shows the uh, number of townhome developments within uh, a half mile of the site. Uh, it doesn't include the two apartment complexes just to our west or those apartment complexes shown on the eastern portion of the slide, but just wanted to uh, kind of show that this proposed rezoning uh, is compatible with the uh, general development patterns that we see south of Western Boulevard. Uh, these various townhome developments um, have been built at different times, kind of beginning in the 1980s, uh, all the way up to uh, 2013 with the Grove Park townhomes um, further south down Carolina Avenue. So this slide really just highlights that you know, the proposed rezoning um, would allow for townhomes and that townhomes um, would not be a departure uh, from the general you know, development types in this area. It would honestly be, um, you know, furthering those development patterns that we've seen in this area for over uh, 35 years. Next slide, please. Here are some specific examples, um, just some photos that we took of the nearby townhome developments. This is Grove Park townhomes. This is off of Carolina Avenue and it's about a tenth of a mile uh, from our site. Um, so you see two-story pitched roof. Um, next slide please. Just a, another uh, example of the Grove Park townhomes uh, here um, on Carolina Avenue. Uh, and here uh, on this slide that's shown currently, these are the Carolina Avenue townhomes. Uh, these are immediately south of our site. Um, again, you see uh, the two stories, the pitched roof. Um, and, and so this rezoning, um, you know, again, would be compatible not only with the general development patterns that we've seen south of Western Boulevard, but even more specifically, those sites that are nearest to us. Uh, next slide, please. As John uh, mentioned, we have uh, three zoning conditions attached with this case. Uh, the first um, is prohibiting the apartment building type. Um, this will ensure that uh, the residential uses on the property will be compatible um, with other developments along Carolina and Grove Avenues. Um, the second zoning condition we have is a minimum 30 foot principal building setback from the adjacent properties to the south. Uh, this establishes uh, an additional buffer from those parcels. Um, you know, we believe that, you know, given the stream that John mentioned um, that runs, you know, along kind of the southern end of, of this site, 
uh, that area um, is best used for buffering and, and tree conservation. And so we, we wanted to, you know, memorialize that in a, <clears throat> in a zoning condition. Um, and I also wanted to note that the nearest um, Carolina Avenue townhome, those that are immediately to the south of us, uh, the nearest townhome is approximately 90 feet from the shared property line. So that minimum distance between the nearest uh, dwelling unit on this site and that of the Carolina Avenue townhomes would be uh, at a minimum approximately 120 feet. And uh, the other adjacent uh, parcel to our south is vacant. Um, our last zoning condition is that all principal structures shall have a minimum roof pitch of four over 12. Uh, and this again, just ensures that um, all residential buildings on this site uh, will have similar architectural features um, to those that we just uh, shown on our, our slide deck, basically saying these aren't gonna be flat roof uh, dwelling units. Um, just to conclude, um, the proposed zoning would change um, the site from R6 to R10 in a core transit area just south of Western Boulevard. Uh, this rezoning is, is consistent with the urban form map and would further the goals of the BRT by adding that missile, missing middle housing um, near a transit stop. Uh, additionally, the resulting density of 10 units per acre is aligned with the mixed future land use map designations of moderate and low density residential. Uh, through our zoning conditions, this residential development would align with those previous townhome developments that we've seen south of, south of Western Boulevard uh, and is compatible generally with the surrounding area. Uh, we ask that you recommend approval of Z1520 because it is consistent with the comprehensive plan and is reasonable and in the public interest. Um, I'll be happy to take any questions that uh, Planning Commission might have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Um, and we will hold questions until we've um, heard from everybody today. Um, there are some members of the public signed up to speak. Um, and I would like to remind that each speaker has two minutes to provide comment. Um, the first speaker we have today is Maria D'Amelio. Ms. D'Amelio, are you available? Yes. Um, and you can all see the map that I put up. Um, yes. I am, the map shows the, thanks for hearing from me. The map shows the traffic flow <clears throat> that is used by the people in this neighborhood. The arrows show how the traffic that is coming from downtown Raleigh gets to the parcel of land in question. There is a median on Western Boulevard preventing any left-hand turns coming from westbound Western Boulevard onto Grove Avenue. That's where the black X is. Um, the red line shows the traffic flow. So people turn left on Powell, right onto Limville, and then right onto Grove Avenue to get to that lot. Carolina Avenue has a blind spot on it, so it's very dangerous to make a left-hand turn on that lane or to make a right onto Western Boulevard. Um, there's no sidewalk. There's no bike lanes. Um, my house is on one of the streets that's affected. It's on Limville Drive. Um, I've made you aware during previous rezoning cases that I have a severely autistic son. Um, he's a type has a type of autism that people don't talk about. Um, I did send you all an email regarding that. Uh, he likes to, when he gets upset, opening the car door while it's in motion. Um, I'm extremely frightened of the risks of the, of the increased risks to his well-being because of the increased traffic that is going to be coming down my street. We are not the only handicapped individuals in the neighborhood. Two doors down, we have a developmentally disabled man that walks to the Harris Teeter every day down Limville Drive and Grove Avenue. There is also subsidized housing on Powell Drive that's also on that route that's marked for handicapped individuals, physically and, and uh, developmentally handicapped, that wait on Powell Drive to access their transportation vans that come to get them to go to work. Um, you guys all had a equity meeting right before you went on break. Um, uh, that Ms. was Di talking. Ms. D'Amelio, I believe your time is up. Okay. I'm sorry to um, cut you off. That's Thank fine. You. That's typical for, you know. That's typical. Okay. Two minutes goes fast, I know. Yes, it Thank does. Thank you so much. 
Um, we'll now uh, move to um, Paul Houghton. Paul is not on the line. He is not on the line. Okay. Um, if, okay. Um, do any of the commissioners want to continue hearing from Ms. D'Amelio? That's a yes. Okay. Um, I guess, Travis, do we need, since we don't have our second speaker, we could uh, give that time to her. Um, do we need to vote on that by a show of hands? Yes, ma'am. You can assign as much time for the speaker as you wish. And if, if you would just like to ask the question and then ask the commissioners to raise their hand in concurrence, you can move along without taking the okay. roll call. Okay, great. So um, all those in favor of uh, providing uh, Ms. D'Amelio two additional minutes to finish speaking, please raise their hand. Any opposed? All right, that looks unanimous. Ms. D'Amelio, are you still there? Yes, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, You're very welcome. And it won't take me two minutes, but um, so I'm hoping that you all can draw on what you learned in the equity training <clears throat> to vote against this rezoning and in favor of safety for an extremely marginalized group of individuals. Most handicapped people, especially those living in subsidized housing, don't have the disposable income to be able to relocate because they're safe, just because their safety is put in jeopardy. Um, I'm hopeful that you can agree with me that this is not a parcel that should be rezoned to allow for higher density. Um, the, you know that the Grove Avenue portion is low, is for low density in the um, future land use map. And um, there was also a rezoning application that was denied last year for a lot that uh, three de three lots down from this down the street on the Grove Avenue um, because of stormwater issues, and that's all. Thank you for your thoughtful consideration. Thank you, Ms. D'Amelio. All right, um, so that's a comments from the public. Um, I would um, allow for any questions or comments from commissioners. If does anyone have questions or comments? If so, uh, please be recognized to speak. Okay, uh, Commissioner Bennett. Yes, uh, I have a question and a comment. I guess my question first, um, in light of what Ms. D'Amelio was um, addressing, was there any coordination between the applicant and this um, housing development or any type of coordination with the neighborhood, any type of discussion about sidewalks or putting in some sort of infrastructure um, so that it is safe because there are people apparently catching transportation that um, may have developmental disabilities and this would be adding traffic. Um, that's my question. And then my comment is I noted in the staff report that um, it mentioned the equitable development around transit report that was coming. And um, as a result of that report, we were likely to get additional policy guidance for rezoning in this area. And so my question was, is it appropriate for us to take an action on this right now if there may be some sort of additional guidance coming as a result of this equitable development around transit document? Um, might we make some sort of recommendation that could be inconsistent with the policy guidance that comes from that? Um, so those are my two questions. Thank you, Commissioner Bennett. I think one question is for the applicant, uh, whether there was any discussion with neighbors. Yes, so I have not had any conversations with Ms. D'Amelio uh, individually. Um, I, I can offer that, you know, as part of the development of this site, we would be required to install sidewalks along all um, frontage areas on Carolina Avenue, as well as Grove Avenue. Um, in addition, 
um, there is a there is an extension of Barstow Drive, which is just north of our site, um, that we would be um, paving as well. And so between the sidewalks along Carolina Avenue, Grove Avenue, and the build out of Barstow Drive, which connect, which would connect the two avenues together, um, we feel that the safety in this area would be enhanced with this rezoning rather than um, detract from it. Um, as of right now, there are no sidewalks um, on Carolina Avenue or Grove Avenue, and so you know having you know the build out of this you know, small portion of Carolina Avenue and, and that Barstow Drive, I believe would, would help in that regard. Um, as far as accessibility into the site, um, I've driven out there a couple of times uh, just to do, uh, you know, some, some property research on my own. Um, personally, I didn't have any issues getting into the site, um, being able to, to make a left from Western onto Carolina Avenue. Um, but as far as um, infrastructure goes, there would be uh, significant additions, um, both to the existing Carolina Avenue and Grove Avenues, as well as the extension of Barstow Drive. Thank you. Um, and the question about equitable development guidelines around transit um, that's forthcoming, I guess, is that it? That would be a staff question. Sure, and I can answer that. Um, Ms. Bennett raises a good question. Oftentimes we're in the process as the city of uh, performing larger area studies or uh, going through uh, additional design on a corridor. In a perfect world, the rezoning application would come coincident with the area planning or after the area planning. Um, but that doesn't always happen as we see in this case. Uh, sometimes the zoning application comes in before uh, the city has completed their efforts. So uh, while I can understand the desire to have the discussion happen all at once, um, generally it's, it's not advisable to hold a zoning application for the city to finish its efforts because we just don't know the timeline for the city's efforts. We, we could take a substantial amount of time to go through the, the um, equitable development around transit project. So uh, having uh, to defer this application for the city's efforts uh, would place a burden on the applicant. Thank you. Commissioner Fox. A follow-up question on the equitable development around transit um, guidelines. Um, as I understand, a majority of those guidelines are dealing with um, of affordable housing and supplying affordable housing around transit. Is there additional guidelines um, contemplated that deal with uh, how the city might prioritize um, undeveloped parks land or um, inserting sidewalks or pedestrian infrastructure in existing neighborhoods? That certainly can be a part of the conversation. I'm, I'm not certain that there has been um, sufficient detail on any of those items to date, only because the project is still in its infancy. Um, but you're right, the discussion about affordable housing coincident with transit will be a major focus. Um, additionally, there will be discussion about pedestrian connectivity and street connectivity related, um, but that, that's not something that's been fully scoped to date. Commissioner Winters. Thank you. Also as a follow-up to uh, Commissioner Bennett, um, for the applicant, um, let me just go back and say that I did re read Ms. D'Amelio's um, email. Thank you so much for sharing that information with us. And also with further expansion, sorry, thought I was going to um, do not, uh, whatever. Anyway, um, my my concern is with the other housing unit, uh, the affordable housing unit that is also for um, special needs. Has the applicant had the conversation with that entity as well? Because it sounds as though there will be a, a special set of needs since we're, go since we're going back and you're looking at sidewalks, engaging that um, segment as well as to what they may need in particular. 
especially with them being having the the challenges that they have in such close proximity. Do I need to restate my question? Um, Mr. Uh, this is a question for Mr. Mills, correct? Yes, for the applicant, yes. Yep. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, <laughs> we have not um, had any discussions um, with the supportive housing development um, as far as um, you know, infrastructure needs and sidewalks, but uh, I, I will just reiterate that, you know, along all of our frontage of Carolina Avenue, Grove Avenue, and Barstow Drive, and we would be offering, you know, the, the complete street on, on our sides of the, of the roads. Um, and so just from a code compliance standpoint, uh, I think that would offer a significant benefit um, to all the neighbors in the area. Um, but we haven't had any discussions about, you know, the specific needs of, of that development and how that would relate to to our you know build out of, of sidewalks if I'm um commissioner fox and then we'll go back to you commissioner winters oh we can't hear you am i unmuted you're good now thank you awesome um, would we be able to pull up a map and point out where that supportive housing is located? I just looked on IMAPS. There is one at the corner, the western corner of Carolina Avenue and Western Boulevard. I did not see one further south in the neighborhood from the rezoning site on, on IMAPS. Thanks, John. Um, Commissioner Winters. Um, while I am, I'll say this, this is where I am now. Wait, can you show it to me again? I'm trying to find it where it is on this thing. I am, uh, I'll just speak generally. I am for uh, development in terms of the missing middle addressing that, addressing that uh, as we're, we are uh, meeting it within the city. I do think my hesitance is when we have um, situations such as this, when there is a parcel that is uh, related for uh, people with certain with challenges, uh, more so marginalized communities and making sure that their needs are met. While I do appreciate uh, what the build out will do for the community at large, I'm more of a proponent for actually having the conversation with um, impacted communities as we saw, what was it on, Martin Street when we were building out the um, senior center and how there was the, the engagement all along the set uh, all along that 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 um that corridor um, making sure that it was that, that everyone had buy in into the into the, the zone the zoning um, so while I appreciate what this will do I would feel more comfortable if there was more engagement and and buy-in and um, assurance from th from this particular community, uh, especially with especially for the challenges that they face, um, and they were uh, existing in this community, and development is trying to come into an existing a community which they have been dwelling. Um, so again, if I could just have that piece of assurance, I would not, I would feel more comfortable voting in favor. That's my statement. Thank you, Commissioner Winters. Any other additional questions or comments? Okay. Um, seeing no, oh, Commissioner Lampman. Sorry for the delay there. Um, okay. The, um, I know on the previous case, um, there was a lot of discussion about flooding and I just wanna make sure that this particular site um, has addressed those issues as well. Um, I think that um, I, I I wish I had in the packet as the picture of the slide of the I think maybe I do the um, the storm storm drainage and and you know is there any 
consideration in the, you know, having the impervious surface, you know, be limited. Was that something that was taken into consideration? So we maintain consistency between, you know, this area and, and what was approved on the other site? And that might be for staff. I have not had any conversations with the applicant uh, about stormwater improvements. I, I made note of that issue in the staff report. Uh -huh. um, so, you know, it's, I can make note of it. It's really up to the applicant if they'd like to offer a condition uh, to, to address stormwater. I just remember from the last discussion that that was, you know, a, a point of, of importance. And, you know, I think just to maintain a level of consistency there so that, because, you know, stormwater can be an issue as we build out more. I want to make sure that that's taken care of appropriately. Um, is there a way to reflect back on its consistency with the other one? That's not typically a way that we evaluate rezoning requests by comparing one to another. Uh, each one is generally treated as, as unique. Um, right. Property Does itself is, is unique and not substitutable. Uh, and so, no, it's, um, it's just, this one is just down the street from it. Yeah. And so there was uh, in your agenda materials, the memo or the letter from the applicant, uh, providing an accounting of what portion of the drainage area their property constitutes. And that's a response to a requirement in the zoning code that if, if you do have downstream structural, structural flooding, uh, that the city can require a stormwater study for a site, but you mm -hmm. can be exempted from that study if you prove that the, the site is less than a certain percentage of the drainage area, which is what that letter was doing. Uh, so to the extent that we have policy or regulatory support for calling out stormwater issues, um, that is reflected in the staff report and the supporting materials. Uh, it, again, at this point, it is a little bit uh, in the applicant's court as to whether to do anything about those issues. Mm -hmm. and, and I mentioned this as well, because I think to some of the other um, questions and comments is, you know, the more open space that we have, it, it kind of, you know, hits a number of points. One is stormwater and drainage. Um, it also provides um, additional space, uh, open space, less density, or, um, you know, uh, maybe, I don't know, something that allows for, you know, um, a, a greater comfort in terms of, uh, you know, traffic, those kinds of things. I think that there's a benefit there in how the land is utilized on this site. Okay, Commissioner O'Haver. Um, Tika, didn't you mention earlier that someone from Stormwater was available? And I'm, I'm curious what, again, similar to when they go in for permitting for this site as opposed to zoning, what they're gonna be required to do on this parcel to maybe um, uh, address Ms. Lantman's, Commissioner Lantman's question. And, and I believe what we did on this, on the um, site up the street was uh, we had talked about um, the total amount of pervious versus impervious. I'm not sure we made it a condition, but. I believe Ben Brown was on the line at that time and was and was talking about the fact that the way that existing condition occurs now it actually lessens flooding downstream versus increasing it. And I think the applicant agreed to limit their impervious. I believe that's what we did. I, you know, I'm just trying to go back on memory here. But Tika, is someone from Stormwater on? Uh, yes, we are supposed to have someone uh, staff in Stormwater here to help address that. Hi, this is Ashley Rogers uh, with Stormwater. And I'm sorry, I was not at the the last meeting where this other case was um, discussed. As, as Mr. O'Haver said, that was Ben that was here that meeting. Um, so this site would be subject to active stormwater controls, uh, nutrient loading requirements, and rate of runoff control requirements. Um, as staff has said, the other um, particular thing that we would look at in code is if there's downstream structural flooding, um, then we can require that extra study and potentially uh, additional controls. But there is that exemption if you're less than 5% of the total drainage area to a point, 
um, to the point of structural flooding, then you do not have to do that study. And so this particular site, I believe they were just at like 1% of the drainage area to the point of structural flooding. So they would not be required under code to do that additional study. Okay, thank you. So can I follow up question, Ashley? Yes. Um, and I, and I, I believe they, during the staff presentation, presentation they talked about an open stream i don't think it's classified as a stream it's an open channel i believe or maybe it is a stream but it's not regulated but are they required to mitigate any of that or are they allowed to leave that open so if they're when you say are they required to leave that open i guess it would depend on whether there's a news riparian buffer stream or not uh, I think that was the case possibly with the last one um, that they were saying they were leaving that buffered area along the stream open. Um, obviously, the state determines what you can or cannot do in a new riparian buffered stream um, in that 50 foot buffer on either side. And um, so that would be, I guess, the main thing that we would be looking at would be, is it a new riparian buffered stream or not? Okay, thank you. Commissioner, do you have your hand up? No, sorry. Any other additional comments or questions? Commissioner Lampman. I'm just trying to understand on this one, is there um, a vegetative buffer that's similar to the other one that allows for, um, you know, uh, that type of drainage? I think that's a question for the applicant. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I will note that um, in our preliminary studies of the site, we have identified this stream um, for a 50 foot Noose River riparian buffer that was determined by um, environmental engineers. And so we would be providing a 50 foot buffer from that stream per code requirements. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think we can adequately provide the open space and the stormwater management um, that is needed uh, in this area. Um, and so, you know, I'm confident in the development and the developer to be able to meet all of their stormwater requirements on site. I think if I'm looking back correctly, I think the... Um Z820 510 Carolina Avenue. I think they had a 75 foot buffer. Yes, I think the condition they offered was to retain the existing trees along Carolina Avenue uh, that basically were, part, you know, growing in the um, along the stream bank. Does the, um, and, and I apologize for, for drilling down on these so specifically is one, I want um, to ensure that there is a level of consistency in this particular area because these are two projects that are coming in um, back to back for um, this neighborhood. Um, you know, obviously there is concern about um, people's safety in this area. Um, the more um, consistent setbacks that we ensure along this road, um, yes, it might encroach on some of the, um, I know people don't like my vernacular here, the, the developable area, <laughs> um, but um, it does kind of constrict some of that ability, which maintains that consistency and also provides the, um, the benefit for stormwater and also the safety of the residents. So um, that's why I'm drilling down on this. I know we're not as actively discussing this one as we were on the last one, but I think that the consistency is important. And I think the neighbors spoke on the last one and they're speaking on this one as well. Um, again, it's um, when you have the two coming down, it makes a difference overall. So um, hearing, um, you know, a lot of discussion about um, stormwater, bringing that making, trying to make the requirements um, or the conditions for that uh, 
in keeping with the previous case, which I know we aren't, we're not, uh, our job is not to uh, compare cases, uh, but just to deal on a per case basis. But um, I also am hearing um, some concerns about um, addressing the neighbors and with under that umbrella, you know, the issue of supportive housing, safety with sidewalks, safety with traffic, um, and then also just recognizing that this is an area that's been flagged for um, receiving some guidelines on development around transit. Um, and so just trying to recognize that that's also important in this area. Um, this is the first time we've heard this case. And um, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm asking if the applicant would be willing to um, hold it at the table uh, to look at some of these questions that have been raised and see if there's some additional conditions that they might want to offer. And I guess if the commission would, would like for that to occur as a whole. I'm seeing a couple of yeses. Okay. Mr. Mills, um, is that something that you uh, would be opening to entertaining? We can look at uh, additional conditions that uh, address stormwater. Um, on the, the traffic um, and safety concerns, I'm trying to think of ways that we could, you know, address those concerns. And, and I'm not entirely sure what that would look like. I, I don't know if there's any guidance that the planning commission or staff might be able to offer um, in terms of, you know, how best to accomplish that through zoning conditions. Um, if there, if there are, you know, we're happy to explore those and to reach out to Ms. D'Amelio um, as well. Thank you. Um, are there, yes, Commissioner McIntosh. Um, in the earlier case on um, Hillsborough, there was the um, mention that sometimes along with the development, um, additional sidewalks can be offered beyond uh, the frontage of the property. So that would potentially be one um, possible approach to helping the existing neighborhood. Okay, I can, we, we can explore that um, and see you know, what, what it is that we're able to do in that regard. All right, thank you. Um, are there more specifics on either traffic or stormwater that we can offer the applicant? I think one would be, I think I've heard a couple of times um, just reaching out to the neighbors and establishing conversation with them and hearing what their concerns are and, and seeing if there's ways that you can address that, the concern. Uh, so yep. that be something, okay. We, we could explore um, those, those various options. And I don't know if this is if how other commissioners feel, but I think one tool that we found really helpful was the comparison, Mr. Haver um, brought this up, but the comparison of um, stormwater kind of on the site um, as is, as is developable by right, and then as is proposed, uh, the proposed development. But we found that pretty useful before and feel like we had a pretty good grasp of is this, you know, the site may actually be improved uh, or if it's not, in what way is it not? So that might be something worth con uh, considering. And then uh, any specifics on a vegetative protected area? 
Uh, Commissioner Lantman. I, I, I absolutely agree. And Tika, I appreciate you summarizing all this for us. Um, I think to the applicant, there is a way, I think, where you can come up with conditions that will satisfy all of us with one, like the setbacks, the, the vegetation. I think that can help, um, you know, tackle a number of these issues at once. Um, I do like the cottage court, um, you know, proposal. So I think that it is a good site. It's just, you know, I think that there's a way to meet these grounds. So thanks. All right, great, thank you. So um, seeing no further comment, um, Travis, we, do we need to vote to hold it at the table or we can just hold it, I can just hold it at the table? Yes, ma'am, that's correct. You can um, mention that without any objection, it will be held at the table. Thank you. So without any other objection, we will hold um, case Z1520 until, um, we can either hold it until our next meeting if the applicant feels like there's enough time uh, to develop the conditions and, and do the work he needs to do, or um, we can hold it at the table until the conditions are submitted and then staff can calendar the case at that point. I might actually um, suggest that you, you give the applicant a little bit more time and just leave it open-ended that way if uh, okay. the applicant can uh, accomplish uh, revised conditions and, and talk with the neighbors before the next meeting, um, that would be helpful and we could advance the case. If not, uh, you can take a little bit more time. Okay, great. Uh, does that sound uh, good to the applicant as well? Mr. Mills, if you're speaking, I think you're muted. It looks like he's having trouble with his mic. I see it muting and unmuting. Okay, can he chat it to us? Yeah, it looks like he's still trying to chat in and out. Um, Worth, if you could hear, it, it might be helpful if you chatted the moderator. And this would be to hold um, case Z1520 for uh, additional conditions. And then it, staff can calendar the case once those conditions are received. Thanks for everybody's patience. Technology. Uh, while we're waiting, I could correct um, when I was talking about the statement about adding sidewalks, I was talking about uh, Z1120 Chapel Hill Road and Gary Street, not Hillsboro. Oh, that's for the record. Thank you. Okay, so a moderator just reached out to me. Um, and Worth has asked to be heard in two weeks, uh, so he would like to come back. What that means is new draft conditions must be submitted by this Friday. So um, to be on that meeting, those conditions need to be submitted to staff by end of day uh, this Friday. Uh, Commissioner Bennett. And will that include outreach to the community? The applicant wasn't specific, but that was part of the Planning Commission's recommendation for deferral 
Uh, so he would need to have that outreach and the new conditions done by your next meeting. Okay. Thank Commissioner, you. Commissioner O'Haver. Ms. Bennett covered my question. That was exactly okay. what I was going to ask. Great. Um, in which case, um, seeing if with no further objection, with no objection, case Z1520 will be deferred until our next planning commission meeting, which is on, Travis, can you help me out? Uh, let's see. I believe it's September 8th. September 8th is your next meeting. Yeah, thank you. September 8th um, for additional conditions. And with that, we move on to the next case. The next case is a F1Z920. And this case was deferred at the beginning of the meeting. Um, so we will move on to the next case after that which is case F2, Z1420, Macon Pond Road. This is a request, um, oh, sorry, I wanna backtrack. I've been forgetting to do this at the end of each case. I just wanted to thank the applicant and the public for their comments and participation in the, the previous case. Um, item F2, case number Z1420, Macon Pond Road. Um, this is the request to rezone approximately 4.3 acres of land from residential four to office mixed use, five stories conditional use. Anna Reckow will present on behalf of city staff. Good morning. So yes, this is Z1420. It's a request to rezone approximately 4.32 acres from R4 to OX5 CU. Uh, the deadline for action would be November 23rd. Um, I'll make a few notes right up front um, in case the commission would like to defer uh, the case to another meeting. Um, the first is uh, that the proposed conditions uh, that were received in time for consideration at this meeting do include some language that conflicted with some sections of the video. Uh, staff has since received revised conditions that address that issue. Um, those could be considered at a future meeting, but they were not received um, in time to, for consideration at this meeting. Um, the second is that um, the request is inconsistent with the future land use map and the comprehensive plan overall. So the commission has the option to refer the item for the discussion at committee of the whole. Um, and then the last note is that mailed and posted notice was given uh, to neighbors ahead of this meeting. Uh, so if anyone Hannah, has signed up, it's a appropriate. Hannah, excuse mm -hmm. me one second. I'm having a really hard time understanding you. I don't know if any other commissioners are. Um, yes. I don't know if you can adjust your volume or your mic. I'm not is sure what too you- too low? That, try that again. Is the volume too low? Is that the issue? This, this sound, that you sound better now. It just, yeah, it was very muffled, I think. Thank you. All right. Um, so mailed and posted notice was given to ahead of uh, to neighbors ahead of this meeting. Um, so unless the commission would like to defer at this time, I can provide an overview of the request. Um, the next slide uh, shows the overall context. So this is located at the corner of Edwards Mill Road and Macon Pond Road. And so it's south of Umstead State Park near the intersection of Edwards Mill and Durley Road, west of UNC Rex Hospital and other medical uses. Um, there is a residential area to the north that is not directly adjacent, uh, but and not uh, directly connected to the site and um, some open uses to the south, including a state park, state forest rather. Um, the following slide is a close-up of this site. Uh, the site is four parcels, one of which has a detached house. Uh, Macon Pond Road is a dead-end street currently. Um, there's a pond directly to the west of the site. The next slide uh, shows some views of the rezoning site. It is mostly forested and developed at this time. Um, and you can see that Macon Pond Road, if developed, would need to be brought up to UDO standards. Uh, next slide. Uh, there are five conditions that are offered. Um, these include ones that prohibit uses, normally 
permitted in OX and offer limits to office use and retail and restaurant use, as well as a condition that would limit the density of residential uses overall to 28 dwelling units per acre and single unit living to four dwelling units per acre. Um, and the fifth condition, um, as we have heard in the beginning, um, is pertains, uh, offers a transit easement to the city. Uh, currently includes, or the version that was received in time, and uh, included in the staff report, did include some language that conflicts with um, some city process. Um, so it is listed as an outstanding issue in the staff report. Um, but uh, staff has received revised conditions that uh, address that issue, and, and that could be considered at a future meeting. The next slide um, existing versus proposed zoning. So, this is a residential district requested um, to be a mixed use district. So, the single density of single unit residential uses for the conditions would not change. However, other residential uses, including multi unit residential, could be permitted up to 28 dwelling units per acre. Um, it also would permit uh, commercial uses. Uh, the conditions limit office use to 130,000 square feet. And um, office mixed use districts do limit, uh, have limited use standards for retail. So it would limit it to 50% of a multi tenant building. And the conditions offer another limitation down to 5,000 square feet. The next slide shows the future land use map designation, which is medium density residential. So this is a designation that would envision uh, residential uses primarily between five stories. Um, the request of office mixed use is inconsistent with this designation as it would um, permit uh, standalone non-residential uses. So a approval of this request would amend the future land use map uh, to the office and residential mixed use. Designation. The site does not have urban form guidance that applies to it, but it is uh, adjacent to an existing city center. Um, the request is inconsistent overall with the comprehensive plan, and that includes the future land use map. There are a few of consistent policies uh, that are on the next slide. Um, these have to do with the location of growth for the DJ. So the site is unincorporated currently, but surrounded on all sides by city limits, as well as policies about uh, entering right of way uh, for transit. Um, the next slide shows inconsistent policies. So this uh, is points again to the future land use map, as well as two policies regarding infrastructure. Um, so the increase in, in entitlement uh, be possible under the requested district to trigger a traffic impact analysis in the zoning stage. There's a technical memo that's included in the backup materials. Um, the findings were that the traffic would, you would reduce the level of service at nearby um, intersections below the video standards for acceptable traffic. Um, it did identify some mitigations uh, that would partially mitigate those impacts, but would not raise the level of service at all those intersections to an acceptable level. So considering the divergence from the future land use map, the concerns on infrastructure sufficiency uh, the request is inconsistent overall with the conference plan. And so again, your deadline for action is in November. Um, and there's the one outstanding issue. I don't know if you answer any questions. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we will um, now hear from the applicant, Isabel Maddox. Uh, she will present on behalf of the applicant. As a reminder, the applicant and all those in support have 10 minutes to speak. Ms. Maddox. Good morning, signing commissioners. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Hi, Good I'm Isabel Maddox, PO Box 946, Raleigh 27602. Here today virtually are, with me are Julie Gavigan of Blue Hill Development, the developer of this project. Um, Adam Ashball, civil engineer, Catherine McPherson, landscape architect, both of them are with ESP Associates. Uh, Brian Gibson, our architect with Hager Smith, Sravia Suradevera, and Mike Saraski of WSP Associates, our traffic engineers. 
Uh, Hannah did a good job with the general explanation, but I want to bring up, I have several exhibits uh, which I've submitted a presentation. I hope um, Hannah or someone at staff is going to pull those up. I'd like to pull up first my slide number two, which shows our proposed site layout. Um, we do propose uh, a medical office building of up to 130,000 square feet it would be majority office with a provision for possibly a small coffee shop or restaurant of maximum of 5,000. We have requested OX5, but we do plan only four stories. However, we will need some flexibility on our absolute height and feet because of some issues, which I'll explain in just a minute. Um, I just want to explain the general context of this area. Um, the property has direct frontage on Edwards Mill, a six lane divided avenue. And if you would pull up slide 10, you'll see the context in terms of other medical uses. We are uh, immediately to the north, there is Rex, um, excuse me, Raleigh Orthopedic. Um, immediately catty corner to this site is the Proposed Rex Cancer Center, which is either under construction or getting ready to be a, a large project by Rex. Um, at the end of Macon Pond to the east is Rex Hospital and the uh, Heart and Vascular Center, and many other medical uses in this in this vicinity. Um, we have had three neighbors meeting, including one Zoom meeting last night. They've all been Zoom meetings, but last night we had a smaller neighbor, neighbors meeting. Um, we have discussed a few additional conditions, and I'll get to those at the end of my presentation. Um, staff also has raised several issues in the staff report. Uh, those issues are primarily the comp plan, traffic, and height. So first on comp plan. Uh, as you know, the comp plan was, was um, adopted in 2009. The future land use map designates this property as medium density residential. However, we believe given the character of the area and changes to that area that office and residential mixed use is actually more appropriate. Um, and the comp plan states that office residential mixed use is applied primarily to frontage lots along major streets where low density residential uses are no longer appropriate. And we think that's actually exactly what we have here. There are some single family lots, these some to our east and some to our north, but of those lots, many are vacant like all the ones to the north are vacant. To our east, they're about half and half vacant or investor owned slash rental properties. And we don't really think that most people are wanting to put a single family detached new house in this area right now. Uh, furthermore, we, we believe as you can see in slide number 11, um, that this property is a, a natural extension of the health and wellness district as promulgated by the uh, Blue Ridge Carter plan. You can see in green on this map on the north northern section of the Blue Ridge Carter plan, the health and wellness district. Our site is represented by the star. So you see we're we're enveloped both on the north and the east with this health and wellness district. And we think we're a logical extension of that. Um, this is sort of a donut hole of, of undeveloped property in, in an area that's highly developed. Um, on height, um, we, as I said, we plan to develop four stories medical office, but there are some constraints that prevent us from limiting the height to the 62 feet, which corresponds to four stories. Um, first, if, if you'll move it to slide number three, you'll see there's significant topo on this site. Uh, there's over, around four, 30 feet of fall from front to back. And that makes height measurements quite difficult, particularly when coupled with the way the city measures heights, which is measured from the average grade of the site. Uh, and you take the more restrictive of either the pre-development uh, average grade or the post-development. So you can't even really do a completion of your measurement until you're already developed. So it's, it's really difficult. And with this much topo change, we feel um, like we, we we don't feel comfortable we can do it in 62 feet. Um, and making it more difficult is, as we know from prior discussions, uh, office takes more story height than residential and medical office actually takes more story height than regular office because of the need to install various equipment. Um, and even though the comp plan states that 
the height for office residential mixed use adjacent to residential should be limited to four stories. It does allow for additional height for larger sites and locations along major corridors where at adjacent uses would not be adversely impacted. And we think again, we're right here. Um, in this case, we do have frontage on Edwards Mill, a major corridor. And we think the impacts to the neighborhood, the residential neighborhoods to our west and northwest will be uh, adequately mitigated. Um, first of all, if you'll go back to the site plan on, on slide three, or excuse me, slide two, um, you'll see that we propose a, a parking deck um, along Macon Pond, which will be lower in height than the principal building, which will be along Edwards Mill. Can you go to slide two, please? Um, which is our site layout. So the taller structure is going to be along Edwards Mill, farther away from the neighborhood. Um, secondly, we, we did some renderings of our parking deck from Macon Pond Road. It's as close as we could get to the neighborhood without being on their property. And if you'll pull up slide four, you'll see what we, our renderings would show. That would be standing at the back of the cul-de-sac. You'll see that that in includes existing vegetation, which will remain, plus additional screening that we propose. And you'll see that and then come, and if you come closer on slide five, come a little closer to that deck. And then on slide six, you get pretty close to our driveway. And so you'll see that there's not, it's not um, really uh, a structure that sticks out. Uh, furthermore, um, if you look at slides eight and nine, uh, you'll see that's slide eight. And that is, well, go back to eight. Eight shows looking to the west. And you'll see there's uh, significant vegetation there now. Slide nine is looking more toward the northwest. And again, significant vegetation. That is not on our property. So that's looking from the corner of our property. You'll see there's significant vegetation there. Finally, if you look on slide seven, you'll see that the distance from lot line to lot line is 322 feet from, from closest house to our closest structure, the parking deck, that's 465 feet. So there, there's significant distance between the residential properties, there's significant existing vegetation, and there's significant proposed screening. Um, so we do think we adequately mitigate uh, any impacts from this, this um, development with regard to the uh, single family residential. Uh, on traffic, um, there are some issues on traffic, but we have had a TIA done, which has been fully reviewed and accepted by transportation staff. Um, the general conclusion was that the level of additional incremental traffic added by this development was minimal. Uh, the TIA did acknowledge that the intersection of Macon Pond and Edwards Mill is challenged and proposed a number of improvements to to Macon Pond Road, including a dedicated left turn lane. So you're coming down Medi Macon Pond, making a left um, on Edwards Mill. And we have embraced all those suggestions in the TIA and agreed to do those. The, the TIA concluded that the proposed improvements will accommodate the traffic generated by this project. In addition, there's an NCDOT uh, state transportation improvement project, which will improve the Edwards Mill Duralee intersection to a quadrant intersection. And also importantly, the Rex Cancer Center project will bring the signalization of the intersection of Edwards Mill and Macon Pond, which we think will, will help with safety and traffic. Uh, there'll also be the, the normal improvements that come with any development, which will be road uh, right of way dedication, road widening, additional sidewalks, bike lanes. And also as indicated, we, we will be we offering a transit easement along Edwards Mill. Uh, we have discussed a number of additional possible conditions, and we realize we'll need a deferral of this case to, to submit those. And we, I mentioned, I had a brief conversation with, with uh, Vice Chair Tika Hicks yesterday, and I, I thought we can get those revised conditions in by this Friday, so we, we, would, we would agree with a two-week deferral. So the conditions we would, would hope to add would be... Um, uh, Ms. Maddox? Yes. Um, your time has expired. Um, I think it would be useful for us to hear what conditions um, you would like to offer. So um, with a show of hands, if we want to 
uh, give Ms. Maddox um, an, an additional three minutes to um, provide the conditions. All right, I think that's, anybody opposed? Okay, that's unanimous. Thank you, okay. continue. Thank, thank, you. thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. One of the conditions we discussed with um, Dr. Tred Treadway last night, one of the neighbors was, he, he wanted to make sure the dumpster was located away from the Macon Pond Road and the neighborhood, and we've agreed to do that. We, we will we will identify a location with a significant distance from the neighborhood. Uh, it, it, that'll be one condition. Another one is we will limit our height uh, of both the building and the deck to four stories. We will we'll limit the absolute feet height to 75 feet, which is the five-story limit for the building, but we think we can go lower on the parking deck, and we're working with our engineers on where we can go there. We're hoping we can get somewhere in the range of 65 feet or maybe lower. Um, and um, we, did, we did submit a revised condition cleaning up the wording of the transit easement to staff satisfaction. Uh, so I think those are the conditions we would like to add. We do think this does bring some public benefits in that it adds, uh, we think it's a logical extension of the Blue Ridge Carter plan for the health and wellness district. It will bring some jobs to the area. It will add some much needed medical office space in close proximity to a major hospital and it will bring right away improvements. And if you have questions about any technical issues, we have all of our development team here. And thank you and thank you for the extra time. Thank you. Um, let's see. So there's one member of the public that signed up to speak today. Um, and as a reminder, you have two minutes to provide comment. Um, that speaker is Beth Treadway. Ms. Treadway, are you? I am here. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. I can hear you. Thank Great. You. Awesome. Um, good morning. Thank you for letting me speak with you guys today. I really appreciate it. Um, my husband, children, and I live at 3100 Briar Stream Run, which is in the Bridgeton Park neighborhood. And my home and lot is approximately 250 to 300 feet directly behind the rezoning property in question. Um, my husband and I, as well as multiple neighbors, have attended the developer meetings. And I think we've had some really good um, and productive dialogue with the development team. And we've expressed our concerns regarding the height, noise, lighting, traffic, storm water, and environmental issues. Uh, the developers are requesting the OX5 CU designation, which is inconsistent with the adjoining Rex property um, that is an OX4 CU. And we just feel like this creates a dangerous precedent to us as homeowners with regard to any future development. We are requesting the developer alter the request to that of an OX4 CU, which is consistent with current land use of the neighboring Rex property and on the same side of Edwards Mill Road. Um, our neighborhood is also concerned with the requested height of the parking deck and building. And due to its close proximity, we are troubled um, that the development will bring large increases in traffic, noise, volume, lighting, as well as stormwater runoff, pollution, and erosion into the 600 by 300 foot lake that directly abuts the property, um, as well as the creek that it feeds into, which runs behind my house. There are already some issues with lake overflow flooding into this creek. And with excessive rainfall um, and added, um, you know, rainfall, stormwater runoff pollution going into that, I think that's just going to create more of a problem um, based on, you know, the amount of impervious surface area that will probably be there with the project. Um, also, it seems that there's no, been no formal grading study that's currently been completed. And in our opinion, it's something that's important and needed from the back of my lot to the area where the parking lot um, deck and building will go in there's a 30 to 40 foot excuse me difference in grade um in winter with the leaves off the trees that will make it look even more imposing and so i would just like to encourage the commission to consider a request of a change to ox4 as well as more in-depth studies from the developer on light noise mitigation grading larger repairing buffers to assist with runoff uh pollution erosion and tree preservation thank you so thank much you. thank you Okay, um, just um, I, to um, bring to, to all the commissioners' attention, this case is double inconsistent. Um, so uh, typically we either uh, send um, 
cases like this straight to Committee of the Whole, or we can hold it at the table for additional conditions. Um, and since we seem to have, have had time to review this case and we had someone speaking from the public, um, I, I uh, thought it would be good to hear from everybody. Um, and so um, now I would like to allow for questions or comments from the commissioners. Does anybody have questions or comments? Please be recognized to speak up. Uh, Commissioner Haver. Thank you, Commissioner Hicks. A couple of things. Um, I am very familiar with this corridor, doing a lot of work at Rex, and I'm very familiar with their master plan, worked on their master plan for that site to the Northeast, which is adjacent to here. So um, from my personal experience, I believe that uh, the recommended change is consistent. I can confirm that there is an extension of Blue Ridge Road, which is now currently named Hopeful Drive, and there is additional uh, connectivity that will occur on that Western campus uh, to Rex. Um, I would like to suggest, I'm, I, I guess generally I'm leaning to deferring it for two weeks, um, but would like to hear from the rest of the commissioners, obviously. Uh, but if we do wait, or if we do defer it for two weeks, or I guess if it goes to the a whole, I think it would be helpful. This is the third time since I've been on the commission. And again, I'm very familiar with issues on how you, how the city requires you to measure height and how challenging that is at this stage in the process. And so the, the uh, neighbor's request to keep it to four stories and Ms. Maddox's request to five to give them some flexibility on how it's measured. I'm fully familiar with it. I, I battle it on many, many projects, but I think it might be helpful for staff to put together just a general presentation so that we're all kind of clear on the challenges with the height. So that's one thing um, I would like to recommend. And then um, can, can we confirm that the property to the south, that's all state land, correct? Anybody? Uh, that would be a question for staff, I staff. guess. Commissioner O'Haver, I believe you're correct. There's a very large tract of land just to the west of the, the lake that's been referenced, and that's all the state of North Carolina property. Okay. So I guess on the traffic issue, too, again, because we're dealing with that with Rex, we're, we're making some significant improvements. I know that Blue Ridge Road is being improved all the way to the east. And as Ms. Maddox mentioned, there are NCDOT um, plans to improve uh, Durley and Edwards Mill, which is, is kind of pinch point again, I know just from working on the Rex Cancer Center and the master plan. So I just wanted to share that insight with the rest of the commissioners. And um, I would like to suggest that we defer it for two weeks, but I'd like to hear other folks' comments. Thank you, Commissioner Haver. Commissioner Fox. I also agree it's an appropriate land use in this area. And I would like to give the applicant um, at least two more weeks to be able to address um, some of the items we've talked about, um, specifically seeing those proposed conditions in writing and then perhaps um, a little bit more language about um, tree preservation and buffering to existing neighborhoods. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Bennett. I think this may go along with um, what Commissioner O'Haver was saying about the height. Um, my question is, um, the applicant stated that this was sort of a logical extension of the health and wellness district. And so it's consistent with those um, medical office uses. But if those are OX4, I'm curious as to why this one would need to be OX5. Why couldn't this be consistent with what the other ones are, if it's the same type of use. Maybe that's something they'll, they can address when it comes back to us, but that, that's my question. Thank you, Commissioner Bennett. Um, I think Commissioner Mann, you had your hand up before, and then Commissioner O'Haver. I'm sorry, Commissioner Bennett just um, echoed my, my question, so. Right, thank, you. thank you. Commissioner O'Haver. 
Yeah, I just wanted to reiterate, I think, uh, for the applicant, uh, exactly what Ms. Bennett was saying. I think it would be helpful for them to demonstrate the challenges with the height measurement. And I think that might get to um, Ms. Bennett's question. So just, just uh, reiterating that, and um, that was part of my suggestion to them. Okay, thank you. Um, any further questions or comments? Okay. I guess, uh, sorry, Tika, I oh, guess the thing that, that I heard and, and I'm familiar with, um, and, and Ms. Bennett is right, some of the adjacent uses are MOB, but I, but I do know that those finished floor requirements typically are a little bit more just due to the type of equipment they're installing, et cetera. So again, I think to get to Ms. Bennett's question at the next meeting, it might be beneficial for the applicant just to touch base on that as well. Okay. Um, okay, so seeing no further comments, um, it sounds like um, with no further objection, we can defer this case um, for another two weeks if the, um, for additional conditions, if the applicant feels like uh, that's a timeline that they can meet. Um, and some of the areas that we've talked about or asked about as a commission is um, to address the challenge in measuring height. Um, it might be useful for the applicant to further illustrate that as well as staff to provide some information from their end on, on how that's um, addressed or assessed. Um, and to um, provide the proposed conditions that were mentioned at the beginning um, of this case, as, and additionally, um, more conditions that would address tree buffering. Um, am I missing anything? I don't see any, okay. so. Um, that would be useful if we could uh, have some more conditions on these items. And um, we will hold this case um, at the table until the September, the 8th or not, 8th meeting. Um, and uh, Travis, do we need to take a vote on that? No. Okay. No, ma'am. Um, thank you. Um, so, um, thank you very much um, to um, Ms. Treadway for your comments and also to the applicant um, for your presentation. And we will um, hear from you in two weeks. The, um, let's see. So, that takes us through all of the discussion items on our agenda. Good job, everybody. Um, Next is approval of the minutes. I would like to entertain a motion to approve the August 11th meeting minutes. Uh, please be recognized if you'd like to make a motion. Uh, Commissioner Lampman. I make a motion to approve the uh, meeting minutes from August 11th. Okay, do we have a second? Commissioner Fox. So we have a motion and a second to approve the meeting minutes from August 11th. If there's no any, <laughs> uh, Commissioner Bennett. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to say that um, I noted some corrections and some clarifications that needed to be made in the minutes that I've already sent to staff. So um, I don't, Travis, however that would be addressed, I mean, I'm fine with approving the minutes as long as some of those items are addressed. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for the comment um, and thank you for the email. So we did receive uh, some minor corrections to the minutes and, and the way that you can handle this is um, we've got a motion in a second and now we've identified certain issues that need to be corrected in the minutes. Um, you can just say as amended and then vote on them as they've been amended. Okay. Do we need to identify what the amendments are? I think. So the, the amendments, and I, I looked through them quickly last night. I apologize. I received them late. Um, 
they didn't seem to be uh, the substance that changed the tenor of the comments. There were just some typographical errors and some clarifications that were needed. So do we um, have a motion in a second to um, approve the minutes as amended? I do have one question. Is the, uh, were the amendments sent to the group or just to staff? I sent them to Travis because I wanted clarification on how they should be handled. I'm happy to send it to the group if, if but I wanted to, my question was to Travis about how to handle it. I didn't think we needed to go through every little typo during our meeting. And so that was my conversation with Travis. I don't have a problem with everybody seeing them. I mean, if that's part of the approval process, if, I mean, I know they're minor, um, it's just a hesitancy if we just improve something blanketly. Um, I don't know how that gets through to us if, if there's like a protocol for a seamlessness. So if the commission chooses, you can just simply hold the minutes and we'll bring them back at the next meeting and we could share the corrections with the, the entire group. Okay, is that's the will of the commission? Seeing no ob further objection or no objection, we will hold the minute meeting minutes from August 11th until the next meeting so that we can incorporate the correction. Um, now on to the report of the chairperson. Um, so just wanted to mention that Committee of the Whole meeting is this Thursday, August 27th at 4 p.m. Um, this is the first one we've had, I think, since March. So we'll be really happy and glad to get that process going. Um, and so I look forward to seeing everybody there. Um, I do know that um, I, I'm pretty sure that Matt will not be there. Um, so it'd be important for everybody to attend. Um, and that's all I have. Um, now on to the report of the members. Does any member have a report they would like to get? Commissioner Winters. Um, forgive me, it's not necessarily a report, but it's more so a comment. Um, uh, earlier in our conversations, um, there was the comment about um, comparing zonings or for comparing projects. Um, well, I understand that, while I understand why that was said, I think it's important that we, that we also understand that by not making comparisons that also can contribute to inequity if we're looking, if, if we're not making the same judgment or asking the same questions or making the same considerations as we are across the city. Um, and I think uh, not doing that has, been a great um, component of why we've had to have an equity study and why we're seeing the inequity that we've seen across the city. So uh, while I appreciate the comment, um, my focus is trying to uh, have as much equity as we can going forward. Thank you, Commissioner Winters. And um, I, you know, if I can correct, I think that would be useful. I think um, really, uh, not that we want to compare the two cases, but that what we're looking to strive for is consistency among cases. And in particular, we've got two cases that are very close together that have some similar conditions. Um, so thank you for, for bringing that up. And if we could make that clarification for the record, that would be great. Um, any other feedback from commissioners? Okay. Um, so now we go to the report, uh, from the deputy. Bennett. Oh, sorry, Commissioner Bennett, go ahead. Thank you. Um, mine is similar to what Commissioner Winter said, uh, slightly different, but, um, I noted that today and at some of our other meetings as well, the comment has been made that, um, we consider rezonings on a case by case basis and, Oh, that's true. And I appreciate that as a planner, I'm trained to look at these issues holistically. Um, we're a community. We're not a collection of parcels. And so if we look at planning that way, 
we end up with a lot of the inequality that we see. Um, I can't look blindly at a rezoning and not take into account what's happening around it. So for example, that was why I asked the question about the equitable development around transit guidelines, because it seemed to me that there's something going on in that area holistically, not just that parcel. And I like to keep that in mind because I'm looking at down the line how people in the community are going to be affected and trying to make sure that our outcomes are as equitable as possible. That's also why earlier I asked um, if there were going to be some sort of equity review of our comprehensive plan. And um, I'd love to have an update on where that stands and if the, the GARE initiative is actually going to be looking at the comprehensive plan or if it's looking at other issues. And if it's not, I'd really like for someone to take a look at the comprehensive plan because that's our opportunity to look at planning in the city holistically. And that allows us to be more comfortable looking at the rezonings on a case by case basis, because we know the comp plan has already been evaluated through that equity lens. Right now, I'm not so sure that it has, so I'm trying to look at it that way with each of these rezonings. And while that might seem overly burdensome to applicants, that's not my intention. I'm just trying to make sure that we're developing in a way that's holistic and equitable and not piecemeal. Thank you, um, Commissioner Bennett. And I would... Um I think this is sort of a new framework that, you know, a lot of us are, are approaching cases by. Um, and so reminders um, and comments on cases as we go through them are welcome and useful um, to kind of help keep us on track uh, in the interim before we have something like an updated comp plan. Um, and I think also it's good to continue to stay focused on the fact that um, looking for a review of the comp plan with a lens of equity is something that we're all looking for um, and to, you know, keep asking. <laughs> um, so I appreciate you uh, bringing that up as well. Um, and, and I encourage um, all commissioners, you know, to bring those comments and that discussion into, into what we're reviewing and, and we'll, do the best we can and, um, and try to do it in a way that's, um, that's not um, harmful or making it difficult for the applicant, but bringing these important issues to the forefront. So thank you for that. And, you know, it may be this is a topic that uh, we want to take into strategic planning or something like that so that we can really spend some time on it. Um, or if we want to have a special, you know, session as a group. Um, I'm not really sure I would look to staff for some guidance on, on how we can, uh, while we're sort of waiting for these updates to occur, what can we actively do to start reframing the way we are looking at the cases and, and how do we do that in a way that's useful and productive? Sure, and I'd, I'd be happy to offer my perspective quickly. I don't want to belabor the point. Um, these are all great questions and uh, a really uh, good topic for discussion. So first, to the specific, the GAIR project will address comprehensive plan amendments. So uh, just know that that will be coming on the horizon. Um, and maybe to the larger issue about zoning cases that are reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis, it, maybe something was lost in translation. Um, I think that uh, Commissioner Bennett raises a good point, as does Commissioner Winters. You know, the items themselves transcend zoning cases. So the issues uh, are much more broad and are applied across the city, and that much is true. I think the, the comment from staff um, was really more about um, the cases should be viewed uh, individually because the commission doesn't want to be bound by previous decisions. So for instance, the case that you were re reviewing um, uh, that was downstream from another rezoning case that was recently recommended for approval, if the commission felt like there was not merit in recommending approval there, you don't want to feel like your hands are tied and that you must recommend approval for any subsequent case. So the cases themselves are individual. 
and they are specific to its location, but the issues in a larger area can be translated between parcels. I hope that makes sense. Um, that's that's certainly how city staff sees it, and, and we do carry that type of perspective into our reasoning reviews, especially when we have cases that are close to each other. We just don't want to draw too close of a comparative between the cases. Thank you. Okay, well, if, if there's um, no further additional comments from commission, we will move on to the report of the deputy planning director. Thank you. Um, so there were four items that were scheduled for public hearing on September 1st uh, by the city council, Z1719 on Capitol Boulevard, Z5019 Method Road, Z820 Carolina Avenue, and the text change to zoning conditions, uh, TCZ120 at Crabtree Village, that's the Kids Hill property. And then the Planning Commission was granted uh, additional time extension for Z3119 on Needham Road. That was given a 60-day extension, as was Z420 Trailwood Drive. So uh, the Needham Road case has a new deadline of September 25, Trailwood new deadline of October 23. And then finally, uh, the city staff is putting together the Dix Edge Area Study Project, uh, and we're starting to take the initial steps there. Um, in the area planning process. And so we're looking for members on the community leader group uh, and, and the neighborhood ambassador group. So you've received a memo from staff and they've asked for your assistance in either volunteering if you want to um, be a volunteer here and apply for a membership position there. Or if you know someone who might be interested, there's an email address and a phone number listed. So feel free to share that information with interested parties I know that staff would appreciate um, the increased attention there. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just wanted to thank everybody today for uh, your focus. And um, I feel like we, um, well, we were able to get through all the cases. So um, that's a good day. <laughs> um, and uh, look forward to seeing everybody at the Committee of the Whole uh, meeting on Thursday. And with that, that this concludes the meeting of the Planning Commission, and we are adjourned. Great job, Tika. See y'all later. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye.